on this episode of Edge of the Web. So the idea that just doing 10,000 hours of practice will get you anywhere is just wrong. Yep. And so even when we've talked about the science around talent development, the science around creativity, so much of it, I think, has been simplified to a really dangerous point where we don't actually really have a good grasp of what we actually have to do. And so we just sort of say, eh, it's magic. Your weekly digital marketing trends with industry trend-setting guests. You're listening and watching Edge of the Web. Winners of Best Podcast from the Content Marketing Institute for 2017. Here and see more at edgeofthewebradio.com. Now, alongside Tom Broadbeck, here's your host, Aaron Sparks. Uh, how are you doing today? Hey, we're broadcasting from Edge Media Studios located in downtown Indianapolis. <laughs> Each and every week, we bring you uh, some the latest in digital marketing trends, as well as marketing influencers from around the planet. Uh, check out all of our recent show videos, as well as audio, and all the things uh, regarding Edge over at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edgeofthewebradio.com. Uh, we're powered by Site Strategics, the title sponsor of the show. Your digital marketing pioneers specializing in agile digital marketing strategy and execution. If you're interested in what that means to you, uh, go over to Site Strategics, S-I. ITEstrategics.com. Uh, share some information with us and we'll happily uh, set up a, a conference and uh, maybe uh, have, a, have a discovery or two of what we, what could be action items for your online success. So that would be uh, SITEstrategics.com or you can just call us toll free at 877-SEO for web. That's 877-736-4932. I'm your host, Aaron Sparks. I'm the CEO of Site Strategics as well as Edge Media Studios. Uh, the reason we do this show uh, weekly on a regular basis for, for over six years has been to not only, uh, well, primarily focus, debunk and demystify digital marketing tactics. There's so many concepts out there that are elusive to uh, you know, business owners and, and, and marketing uh, directors. Or, uh, you know, it's, it's something that you have to be constantly abreast of and you have to know what's trending, what is, what is not only important, but also uh, what's, uh, what's the junk and not, uh, what, uh, what not to pay attention to whenever you're needing to, to execute good quality digital marketing tactics. It also helps us keep our powder dry, making sure that we are, uh, as a digital agency, continually understanding what's happening in the digital marketing space. So that's why we do it, and we love what we do here. I want to introduce uh, to you our Director of Digital Media, Tom Broadbeck. He's over in the studio today. Hello, hello, hello. He's actually in the production booth. How are you doing, sir? Good. How are you? Excellent, excellent. Uh, uh, I'd like to also introduce our guest today, Alan Gannett of Track Maven. Sir, how are you doing? Good. How about you? Very good. Very good. Uh, how are you doing in Washington, D.C.? It's good. I don't have as cool of a setup as you do. Like, I feel like I have to go renovate my office now, but uh, it's it's okay other than that. Oh, don't don't have studio envy. No, that's not a good <laughs> good, good way to start. You look great. Uh, hey, by the oh. way, you just you just had a, a great win in, in Washington, D.C., right? I know. All caps. We won the Stanley Cup. It's happening. Oh, that's it's awesome. Happening. And that's as far as I know about sports, unfortunately. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll own my geek and and uh, but uh, congratulations that's the first time right it's the first time it's the first time ever I think it's the first time we've won a championship in something like 30 or 40 years so you know wow. people are just discovering that DC is actually a town not just a set of tourist attractions <laughs> Well, there's also a, a lot of other things that are going on in D.C. regularly. That I've heard, I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's check out what's uh, what's uh, going on with you. Uh, I tell you what, we want to kind of deep dive with you on. Uh, you have got a brand new book that's coming out on Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken. Tuesday, June 12th. It's happening. Sweet. So uh, let's group together our audience and let's deep dive with this week's featured guest. Now it's time for Edge of the Web featured interview with Alan Gannett, CEO of TrackMaven. We couldn't not give you the deep voice guy, man. I mean, now I feel much better about this. I have no <laughs> more to do it. It's a great start to the morning whenever you can get uh, uh, some movie magic going on, right? Yeah, it's great. It's great. <laughs> Well, to, to let's introduce you to our uh, audience. Uh, Alan Gannett is a founder and CEO of Track Maven, a marketing a analytics platform uh, whose clients have included Microsoft, Marriott, Saks Fifth Avenue, Home Depot, Aet uh, Aetna, Honda, GE. That's a that's a great deal of of high high echelon clients. There, uh, he's been uh, on the un uh, thirty under thirty lists for both 
Inc. and Forbes. He's also a contributor to for FastCompany.com and has this upcoming book, The Creative Curve, on how anyone can achieve moments of creative genius. Uh, so, so, Alan, uh, we'd certainly like to hear your history from your words. So take it away. Yeah, so my background, I've always been a um, someone who's been really fascinated by the intersection of the left brain and the right brain. So how could you apply sort of reason and rationality to art, creativity, or anything that seems sort of more organic? And so that started with, in college, I started a performance marketing company um, that was primarily on doing Facebook stuff. This was back when Facebook was like the Wild West, which I guess mm -hmm. now is coming home to roost for them in the news. And um, after that, I took a role as CMO of a venture-backed startup, and I was really shocked by, shocked by, struck by, I don't know what words I'm using today, <laughs> struck by the fact that, you know, as marketers, we're tasked with being creative, being storytellers, creating brands, but all of a sudden, these marketers overnight, we're also being tasked with, you know, be a data analyst, do reporting, um, somehow turn into a spreadsheet junkie. And I happen to like that, those types of things. Mm -hmm. I realized that most of my peers didn't. And so the idea for Track Maven was born was about six years ago. And the whole idea was to you know, be a marketer's best friend when it came to data. So we have our own um, technology platform. We can suck in all your data. And then we also have a whole expert team, which can actually, if you don't have your own analysts, can actually help you digest your data and turn it into insights. It's oh, our wow. Our whole thing is, you know, make sure data is actually valuable for you. And then, you know, a few years ago, this was maybe four or five years ago, I started noticing that when I talked to marketers, it was not, it, I heard this like interesting thing where they would say this line that really bugged me, which was like, well, I'm just not that creative. And this really bugged me because I had read a lot of histories around creative geniuses and I've read some of the research on creativity and I knew that, well, the research actually shows that creativity is a learnable skill, so that doesn't make sense. Um, but I came to realize that, like in our popular culture, this is actually not what we believe. Our this sort of popular myth of creativity is that it's this rare thing that a rarefied few have, and the people who have it are these demigods who are <laughs> blessed by you know divine luck, and they popped out of the womb playing you know, music or drawing art or whatever it is. Um, and that's simply not true. That's not actually what science tells us. And so the idea for the book started about three years ago, and basically the whole idea for the book was to unspool and untangle these myths around creativity, and I tell the science about how creativity actually works, and I interviewed about 25 living creative geniuses. These are billionaires like David Rubenstein, you know, Reddit's co-founder Alexis Ohanian, Pasek and Paul, the songwriting duo behind Dear Evan Hansen, La La Land, and The Greatest Showman, Nina Jacobson, the producer of The Hunger Games. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And I interviewed them, and I found what are the patterns from their success, mm -hmm. their creative achievement, that we could actually apply to our own selves. And so, and so yeah, that's the book, and it comes out on Tuesday. So, you know, low key time. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I think uh, you're you're touching on something that is uh, so important for people, by and large, to understand. There has been this stigma like you talk about, of, of uh, creativity being so elusive and unattainable and, and really just planted in the concept of, of these, these savants and these individuals that don't make up the norm of society. But people are creative every day. They're just not giving themselves credit for it. And it's a discipline to think creatively. And, and what you're doing is bringing that home and giving us uh, not only patterns, but also giving us understanding that this is part of all of our makeups, is that creativity is not just for some elite abstract perspective. This is untapped potential for all of us. And, it, and it's, not just, it's not just an explosive, oh my gosh, aha moment, and then you're, you're ultimately a, a creative genius. It's about a discipline of creativity on a regular, in a regular day practice, right? Yeah, it's that. And it's also about, you know, when you look at the studies around creative potential, mm -hmm. right, which is different than creative achievement, mm -hmm. what's so interesting is that um, when they look at studies, they find that, well, it turns out that IQ um, isn't really correlated to creative achievement. Oh, creative wow. So, like, it, it turns out that basically if you have an IQ over 104, which is about the median, so about half the world has an IQ higher, um, so there's 50th percentile. Then, um, if you have an IQ over 104, it turns out there's no correlation between IQ and creative potential. Hmm. So that's billions and billions of people. 
right? That is not a couple dozen. That's not a thousand. That's not a handful of geniuses. Yeah. Um, there's been other studies, for example, that have done um, creativity tests and found that 86% of kindergartners score at the creative potential levels of being a potential creative genius, but only hmm. 60% of high school students do. Oh, wow. And so you see across all these different studies that there's this big disconnect between creative potential and creative achievement. And really what I believe it comes down to is that early on we tell kids to specialize, you know, find the thing you're passionate about. Right. But I think this is actually a very dangerous thing to tell anyone. Absolutely. You tell someone, find something you're passionate about. What you're really telling them is find something that's easy on the first try. <laughs> the reality is, is that there's nothing that's easy on the first try. I remember, you know, I do probably nowadays 100 public talks a year. Yeah. First time. And now for me, doing a public speech is like the easiest thing in the world. Like I can, you know, I no nerves. I barely have to practice. And I get good feedback scores, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully. And, um, but I remember the first time I did it, it was the most terrifying experience, right? Right. And the first 10 times I did it, it was terrifying. And often what you see is these stories we have of creative geniuses like Mozart, for example, are sort of these like historical games of telephone where like, you know, we pretend that Mozart like popped out of the womb playing the piano. And the, the reality is Mozart, when he was three years old, had basically what we would call a helicopter dad. Hmm. And his helicopter dad told him, I love you, but you should never say to a child, you need to become one of the world's best musicians. And he hired for little Mozart, some of the best music teachers in all of Europe, and made this little kid practice three hours every single day. So it's not that Mozart was like naturally amazing. It's that, no, he had the best teachers in the world. Mm. In music, and he practiced three hours every day, seven days a week since he was three. Like wow. that's not the story of just, you know, something coming to you easy. No, and boy, what a disconnect from the, the, uh, the icon that we all use for, I mean, that's, that's almost the default uh, point uh, for discussing any type of creative genius is Mozart or Bach. Oh I mean, yeah, and I mean it's it's, a, it's it's even worse than that. It's even I mean you know there's this, these stories around how Mozart would compose music in his head without mm -hmm. having to draft, mm -hmm. and that comes from a letter that was published in the early 1800s from Mozart where he describes his composition process. Except it turns out that this letter was literally like and I hate to say this term. Mm -hmm. It was hashtag fake news. It was <laughs> it was. A music magazine publisher who wanted to sell copies literally forged this letter. No. Like, it's not a real letter. And so, like, we have these, like, comical notions of creativity in our heads that I actually think partly we like them because it serves as an excuse, right? If it's easy for some people, mm -hmm. that means, well, if it's hard for us, I don't really have to try. I just have to keep searching for my passion. One day, something will be easy. Right. And that's just, like, it's just not how it really works. Why do you think we've been led to believe the line that you have to have the gift of creativity to be creative? Well, I think there's a few reasons. By the way, something's bothering me. This, my luggage, I'm traveling, about to go on book tours right behind me. I'm going to move it because it's, it's, it's <laughs> giving me all sorts of anxiety that there's like a random handle right here. Okay, I feel better now. Those of you who are listening don't know what happened just now, but don't worry about it. Um, I think I think a big part of it is that you know generally we're wired to like heroes. We like these stories. We like the idea that in their culture there's some people who conceivably do the unachievable. Mm -hmm. But I also think it just sells magazines. It sells movies. I mean, the movie Amadeus, you know, which portrayed Mozart as this child prodigy, went on to win eight Academy Awards. So even though it's historically woefully inaccurate, I mean, the whole movie is about how. Salieri and Mozart, you know, Salieri killed Mozart and all this stuff. And like the reality is Salieri and Mozart were basically friends. Mm. Um, Salieri was actually the teacher, the music teacher for Mozart's children. Like, it's just like we have these like silly things that, you know, have been fictionalized and we sort of are bad at recognizing that they're just that, they're fiction. Right. Well, I mean, people, and that's the thing is that um, the, in today's society, by and large, we don't do the due diligence to actually educate ourselves. So we, now we have these fictionalized lines, and there is a lot of rewriting of history where we're putting these creative uh, individuals up on, on a platform and really making an entire new story around them, which is even more of a detriment and even more of a, a, a creation of a gap between us and that individual. And you almost want to, you want to break the, the mystique and, and really kind of get, 
get real is that there's been disciplines on how to be creative. And it's not just – and we talked about this. There's potential and then there's achievement. So there's so many times that that people have potential, but they'll never have the discipline to be able to act on – uh, not only the passion, but also put it put that creativity into practice, right? Yeah, and it's interesting because I think we've also been poorly served by just generally. I think you know my book is part of the the pop psychology tradition of books, which mm-hmm. are is sort of it's stories, it's anecdotes, and science. And I think um, you know I tried to write a book that was different, where um, in the book I interviewed not only practitioners to get answers, but I also interviewed not just read the papers, but I interviewed you know, basically all of the living, leading academics who study creativity and potential. So like Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, Candace Erickson, Gregory Burns, mm-hmm. like people who are big academic titans in addition to people who are big creative titans. And one of the reasons I did that because I had a suspicion that sort of a lot of the ways that we've internalized some of the science that has come out has been wrong. And, you know, I think the best example of sort of this is, you know, Malcolm Gladwell popularized this notion of the 10,000 hours rule, which is you practice anything for 10,000 hours and you can become world class at it. And this, this is something that I think we take as, oh, well, that's a good thing, right? And um, the issue is that it's wrong. And so it's based on this research by Candace Erickson, who's this famous researcher who does ta- studies talent development. Mm-hmm. And I interviewed him for my book, and the quote he gave me, which I put in the book, um, is, quote, Gladwell misread my paper, period, um, unquote. And basically, you know, what, what his research showed us was that. 10,000 hours, well, there's there's two big mistakes that Malcolm Gladwell have with the 10,000 hours rule. One, 10,000 hours was the average across skills and across people. So different people take different amounts of time. Mm-hmm. And different skills take different amounts of time. Like, there are more people who are trying to become world-class piano players that have been doing it for longer than, for example, people who have tried to become world-class at memorizing digits of pi, which now there's competitions for. <laughs> and so, for example, to become right now a world-class piano player takes about 25,000 hours versus becoming a world-class digit memorizer takes 400 hours. Like the idea that there's some like oh, yeah. magical brain cell counter that a 10,000 hours hits go is just right. kind of silly. But then there's a bigger issue. And this is going to the question you were asking. Mm-hmm. The bigger issue is that the paper that Anders Ericsson wrote that turned into the 10,000 hours rule by Malcolm Gladwell says nothing about pure practice. Practice is the repetition of something. Mm -hmm. The entire paper is about deliberate practice. And deliberate practice is actually something very different. Deliberate practice is when you take a big skill and you break it down into very, very small micro skills Mm -hmm. and you practice those micro skills over and over again with some sort of feedback loop. So, for example, if you're a basketball player, it's the difference between playing a game and practicing left-handed mid-court dribbling over and over again with the coach. Right. Or if you're a painter, it's the difference between I'm going to paint a painting and I'm going to practice brush pressure, which is literally I paint one brush stroke and then I try and replicate it. And that's how I learn to get better at brush pressure. Mm-hmm. And it's why, like, you know, you've probably driven a car for 10,000 hours, but you're not a NASCAR driver. Right. right? When you just do practice, essentially what happens is – Things become more automatic. When we do them, it becomes more subconscious, right? Your commute is pretty subconscious at this point. Mm-hmm. And so the idea that just doing 10,000 hours of practice will get you anywhere is just wrong. Yep. And so even when we've talked about the science around talent development, the science around creativity, so much of it, I think, has been simplified to a really dangerous point where we don't actually really have a good grasp of what we actually have to do. And so we just sort of say, eh, it's magical. Right, right, right. Because it, 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 it's difficult. And even furthermore, on those micro practices, you have a gauge of of each micro micro practice of whether or not you're doing it right. Because you can certainly micro practice yourself into mediocrity. <laughs> totally. Right? You need to have part of deliberate practice, part of the science on deliberate practices. You need to have um, either a, you need to have a very clear feedback mechanism, which right. usually form of a teacher sometimes it's like you know with brush pressure you just replicate yourself but you find that when you actually look at you know great talents there's this one famous study done where they took 120 people who were world class across a wide variety of things and they found that of the 120 120 had a master teacher who also was world class oh wow so you find that there's actually a lot of like things that are actually pretty reasonable um when you start looking at these things it's like okay like yeah, Mozart became a really great piano. He also had some of the world's best piano teachers. Like That does have an effect. <laughs>
it also takes away from that mystique that that society wants to bestow on these individuals because all of a sudden now there's hard work now there's a lot of effort and you know all of a sudden uh you know, society by and large is going the path of least resistance they're looking at this going okay well it, it is achievable there are there is a discipline there's spaces in which in which i can practice myself t- on the way to success of, of creative achievement, but it's a lot easier just to paint the picture of that creative genius naturally gifted, right? So there's there's a um, from a soci- sociological standpoint, I, maybe there are some reasons why uh, we haven't broken apart uh, uh, the the science of creativity because you know maybe we were just gun shy of working hard. Totally, totally. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's. I think that's the reality of it all. We just we want, uh, we want to believe that things can come easy to us. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, not to get completely negative in, the, in, the, in the, uh, from a sociological standpoint. Hey, you, you, you. Why do you call the process the creative curve? So one of the things that's really interesting is that you know when scientists look at creativity, um, you know we think about what people like, like what what becomes a success is this like super like you know how does how does that possibly have any rationality to it right how do we know what's going to become a trend or not well it actually turns out that scientists have a pretty good understanding of consumer preference Mm -hmm. and it comes down to these two conflicting biological urges on one side we crave things that are novel because they represent potential rewards for us on the other side we crave things that are familiar because we're scared of the unfamiliar we're worried it might kill us Mm -hmm. But these two things are seemingly contradictory. The result is that we like things that are the right blend of the familiar and the novel. And so what you see is then when you're first exposed to something, you don't like it. But then the more you see it, it becomes less scary. You start to like it more and more Mm -hmm. until it reaches a certain point where it reaches a point of cliche and your novelty seeking wins out. And then you start liking it less and less with each additional exposure. So you see there's this U-shape relationship between familiarity and preference. And scientists have a name for this. They call it the inverted U relationship between familiarity and preference. Mm -hmm. I think that's a terrible name. (laughs) I rebranded it to the creative curve Mm. because I'm a marketer. (laughs) It does sound a lot better. And, and, and we're all, we're all familiar with the curve aspect from, from public education. So we've got that in our background. (laughs) <laughs> you're you're making it more more understandable to the lay yeah. person. Yeah, exactly. That's the goal. Well, you've got four laws of the creative curve, and you started to tap into that without giving the book away. Uh, can we break down each of those areas? So there's four laws I talk about in the book. The first one is consumption. So I explain in the book why you know we think about creators as these people who are constantly doing. Mm-hmm. Like there's that annoying social media meme you've probably seen. Ninety percent of people. Um, 90% of people consume, 9% engage, 1% create, hashtag hustle. It's just, it's like stupid, it's annoying, it's also wrong. Um, then there's, the second law is imitation. So we think of creativity as very focused on originality, but I explain in the book how actually imitating past successful work is a huge part of world-class creative achievement. Mm-hmm. Um, third, I talk about creative communities. So we think of creatives like you know, Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and all these people as these solo geniuses, right. as creativity is this very sort of individual activity. But I debunk some of those myths. And then I also explain how you actually need a certain group of people around you to be creatively successful. And the fourth law is that, is that of data-driven iteration. So um, you know, I think a lot of times we have this notion that you know, a novelist is like going into their writing cabin and writing their book and... Of course, these days it's all coming of age novel. It's all based in Brooklyn, and they only come out of the cabin once they write the words "the end." Huh. But the reality is that when you actually look at the world class creatives, you actually see that they use lots and lots of iterative cycles to get to their final product, mm-hmm. and they use a lot of data and feedback along the way. And so I explain some stories about this, like how Ben and Jerry's does this, how the movie industry does this, um, and it's not things that are necessarily even like high tech or big data, but it's actually I explained in the book, it's actually very lo-fi ways of getting feedback too. That's a good breakdown. And what I mean, that, that demonstrates the the discipline and, and also demonstrates um, 
the, the those myths and and uh, you know, again you have the archetype of of it just comes naturally. Well, it almost never comes naturally. It could be argued that it never does. Yeah, it, I mean, it just here's one of the surprising things that I don't try and hit on too much because I think people sort of have like a <gasps> type of reaction mm -hmm. to it, but. The, the thing which is surprising is when you talk to the professors and the researchers who study and spend all of their lives in talent development, there is like pretty good consensus that natural born talent does not exist. And maybe at best, it's very rare. Um, but we vastly overestimate or sorry, underestimate our brain's ability to change and adapt and get better at things. Mm -hmm. The whole concept around neuroplasticity and neurogenesis, which is that your brain is developing new brain cells every day. Mm -hmm. And those brain cells actually go to the parts of your brain that are most active. And so like you, they've done these studies, for example, where they looked at cab drivers and you know, the longer that someone's a cab driver, the part of their brain tied to visual and navigational skills actually gets bigger. Yeah. Like their brain structurally changes. And I think the issue we have is that we all sort of agree, like like I'm a skinny guy. If I started going to the gym and eating lots of protein, like I would get muscle. Like I would gain muscle. Right. Like we sort of can like agree on that. But for some reason, because we can't see our brain, we're like our brain doesn't change. It's just there. Like <laughs> our brain is what it is. And like no, like our brain. Like think about our brain much like a muscle. Like our brain literally adapts to what we're doing. And they've done studies with old people where they've had them do all sorts of cognitive exercises, and even ten years later. They still see structural changes from those cognitive exercises in their brain. Hmm. Like it's a permanent change. And so the result is that, yeah, if you start playing the piano at three, by the time you're 13, 15, 18, you're going to have a darn lot of talent, but, and your brain's going to be really good at those things. But that's also because you started when you were three, mm -hmm. right? And your brain is adaptable. And so the idea of natural born talent is that is at best overblown and most likely complete myth. You, they may have a propensity, but talent is a misnomer. Talent is the combination right of po potential and achievement, right? Correct. And Fantastic. again, this is the point before, it's like, you know, maybe one person takes them, um, you know, 15,000 hours to become a world-class piano player, and for other people it takes 20, you still become a world-class piano player. You know, hmm. putting in, you know, putting in a little bit more work to get there it doesn't mean it's impossible and so the fact that we write it off is kind of silly no you're absolutely right uh so you've interviewed a number of creative geniuses in this book and that's it's a great way to be able to uh create the your own feedback loop on the theories and the and the uh the uh um uh, the breakout that you're, you're you're providing for understanding and debunking the creative process um, do you have any singular story out of that that was that aha moment of, okay, not only am I on the right trail, but wow, what a watershed uh, uh, story. I mean, one of the stories I talk about in the book um, that um, was really just, you sort of clarified a lot of things for me is I interviewed Ted Sarandos, the chief content officer of Netflix, and he explained to me how his first sort of job in life was he got a job as a clerk at a video rental store when he was 18. And what he decided to do, because video rental stores are empty during the day, is he literally decided to watch every single movie in the store. <laughs> and um, he wasn't being hyperbolic. He literally watched every single movie in the store. This is the 1980s, so there were the less movies, but there were still a lot yeah. of movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and this sort of was a moment for me, because then I realized when I started doing these interviews, over and over again, I kept hearing this trend around consumption where all these creatives were huge consumers of their niche, huge consumers. And that's one of the patterns that's just most striking to me, especially because I think it's so much in the antithesis of what people think when it comes to creatives as these very active people. Um, but that was a moment because then I started seeing that pattern everywhere. Like I can't tell you the amount of novelists who told me some version of like, I lived near the library and read every book in the library. And I was like, oh, I get it. You read a lot of books. But like that same pattern appeared over and over and over again once I started seeing it. And that, that was one of the big takeaways from the book for me. In the book, I explain a lot about not only the fact that this pattern existed, but the science of why we think this is related to creativity. Mm -hmm. No, that's awesome. And uh, anecdotally, I mean, you, you, you always hear um, from a consumption standpoint, you, know, you, you are what you read, right? And, yeah, I love it. And, yeah, and, and on top of that, <laughs> from, from the, the people you hang out with, you choose you you know choose your friends wisely because that's going to be a, a a feedback loop for you to be able to achieve. So I mean you're hitting the 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 the, the, the these great points and you're also 
scientifically proving that. <laughs> it, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, hey, I uh, really appreciate your time. Any any final thoughts that you want to give our audience when it comes down to creativity? Because obviously, we represent our show represents kind of a, a convergence of the marketing mind and the analytical mind. And uh, the analytical mind from the digital marketing standpoint had to. Uh, the, the, you know, there's a, there's a good deal of an, uh, math and analysis that is is learning how to be more marketing savvy, right? So there is this continual need to open up those channels of the left brain and right brain, uh, conversely, for both marketers and, and a, a, analysts. So can you speak speak to uh, that audience? I think the thing the thing that's really important, the thing I'd leave you with, is that you know, in the book I'm laying out a a set of steps you can take to become more creative. Um, but I'm not saying it's easy. And I'm not saying that's going to be a piece of cake. And I think this is one of my worries with when you write a book like this. People go, oh, okay, there's a path. It's, it's going to be easy. No, 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 no. I'm explicitly saying it is very difficult. It takes a huge amount of time, a huge amount of deliberation. It takes a lot of hard, thoughtful practice. Not just hard work, but hard, thoughtful work. Hmm. And so the thing I'd leave you with is that if you want to achieve creative things, the science tells us you have the potential, you are capable, you can do these things, but it's not going to be easy and you should be prepared for a lot of hard work, but it should be motivating that on the other side of that work, there is a reward. That work ethic is by and large um, challenging in this day and age with all the different distractions that that uh, kind of the, 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 the millennial workforce uh, deals with. So. I think this is a great jump start uh, or, a, or a, a shock to the system to realize if and we we know the cliche anything that's worth doing is not easy, right? It's true. And and this is um, and this is this is hypothetical uh, is that if you want to be creative, right? You can be. It's not it's not it's not um not part of your makeup, but you also have to work on it. You have to micro discipline yourself and and get into practice. And you know, if you want it enough, you 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 can achieve that. And the book actually lays that out, right? You got it. Fantastic. Well, uh, I, 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 we really appreciate your time today. To, to wrap up, what we always ask this of our guests: What kind of bugs you in your industry today? Uh, I think the thing that bugs me right now is how. Um, as marketers, I think we go through these hype cycles around new marketing tactics, and um, every three years, it seems like we have to have a new thing that we're in love with and obsessed with. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, it's all marketing. You know, I don't care if you call it influencer marketing, content marketing, account-based marketing, whatever type of hyphen marketing you want to you want to do. At the end of the day, you know, it's about um, building awareness, engaging people, and converting them to to the leads. And so, I think let's become less obsessed with the tactics and more obsessed with the customer. Oh, I love that. Um, conversely, what excites you about your industry right now? Uh, I mean, you're seeing this huge shift to um, brands realizing that they have to create quality um, to retain an audience because people are so ADD. And so I think just the profession of marketing is becoming more fun. You're, you're getting, you know, now that you're seeing this values being placed not to the people who are most interruptive, mm -hmm. the people who create the best quality. And I think that's very good for the longevity of us as an industry. We're finally getting there, aren't we? Yep. Uh, boy, it's been a long trail. <laughs> uh, Jettison the BS of of spin marketing into authentic uh, authority. That's 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 what we're starting to see here. All right, uh, I, I got I got to let our audience know uh, a bit of a fun story. Wheel of Fortune. Oh my God! Uh, when I was eighteen, I got cast on Wheel of Fortune and I lost twice. It was terrible. Uh, I got bankrupt and I lost to Joan from Alexandria, Virginia, who won sixty thousand dollars. No. <laughs> uh, John, if you're out there, feel better. <laughs> oh man, that 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 blows. I'm sorry to hear that. But yeah, I bet you have the 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 wheel of fortune still running back in your head. Why you? are you giving me PTSD? <laughs> I thought this was supposed to be a fun show. I'm out of here. <laughs> hey, all right. So we're going to promote your book here. Uh, let it, let our audience know where they can get it. So The Creative Curve, um, you can check it out. Any online bookstore, any retailer, it's going to be there Tuesday, June 12th. Um, TheCreativeCurve.com. You mm -hmm. can read an excerpt, uh, and you can see my very silly book trailer that features my adorable four-and-a-half-year-old Corgi. So definitely check it out. 
We will. And we'll certainly put the link in the show notes uh, uh, as we publish the audio. Uh, we want to now. This is really cool. You've got like a single word, uh, single name Twitter handle. <laughs> I don't know how you got it, but just follow Alan at Alan. There you go. Kind of Instagram like, and Twitter. Kind of like Prince or Share. <laughs> <laughs> Alan. Uh, Facebook forward slash Alan. Dude, seriously. <laughs> and LinkedIn, they wouldn't give it to you. Alan Gannett, but uh, Instagram is Alan. So he's all the Allens. Uh, I never got that chance. I mean, listen, listen. <laughs> you kill a couple people, you can get anything. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thank you very much for your time today, Alan. We're certainly going to pick up that book. Uh, I think uh, the team here would love to read it. And, uh, and uh, maybe we can even get a, a signed copy from you here sometime soon. Um, it's, 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 Creativity is right there. You can practice your way to it. it. Yeah, you just grab it. It's not easy, but it's there. Uh, so we really appreciate your time. Thanks so much, and good luck on your book. All right, thanks for listening to Edge of the Web Radio, uh, and a special and a special thank you to the colleagues at Site Strategics, especially our guest Alan Gannett. Um, be sure to check out all the must see information over at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edgeofthewebradio.com. Uh, that's it for this week, and we'll be coming back t around to you. We're skipping a week next week, and then coming back around to you uh, at the end of uh, June, I believe. So check out edgeofthewebradio.com, and uh, thanks so much. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Do not be a piece of cyber driftwood. Bye-bye. <laughs>